what does Christmas mean? What is being Christ-like? What is Christ consciousness? Christmas Day, Christmas Eve is really just another day for me. I am not a Christian. And at this point in my life, you know, I've had enough Christmases that I kind of just accepted as another day. But growing up as a youngin, um, you know, I did feel some kind of way. And I think a lot of uh, non-Christians can kind of relate when everybody will come back to school with their new Christmas clothes on and all their Christmas gifts. And, oh, yeah, this necklace is a necklace that my Nana got me. And it was just another year for us. And I would be trying to talk my mom into, like, celebrating Kwanzaa, but she just never really picked up on the Kwanzaa thing. I was really into the idea of, um, you know, get gifts for every day of Kwanzaa. That sounded kind of cool to me. Anyways, Christmas, what does it mean to be Christ-like? And what would be of most service to mankind or whoever's listening to this video um, on, this, on this holiday? Well, you know, as I mentioned before, holidays, in our culture are um it's bittersweet because these are the times between before thanksgiving and after new year's this is where uh depression rises it's the peak of suicides um people feel the most alone um especially with uh the economic impact that this pandemic has had on families uh, many families feel uh, inadequate, parents feel inadequate by a lack of ability to be able to uh, provide the, the holiday, uh, you know, the, the holidays the way that they're used to. Um, the big bird on Thanksgiving, all the gifts and things under the tree, um, because of the, you know, extreme toll that this global pandemic has taken on families and um, this this economic crisis that our family has been experiencing, it can be very uh, daunting. It can be a very, um, you know, shame, I guess you could say shameful time because uh, a lot of people feel embarrassed when they're not able to provide for their families um, during these special holidays the way, they used to, the way they are used to providing. In addition to that, uh, another toll that this uh, pandemic has taken on the the average family is that even if you aren't Christian, you know, even if you are are more on the hotep side like me, where um, Thanksgiving is kind of like a slap in the face to our indigenous brothers and sisters who, uh, you know, it was it was a mass genocide. So the celebration of that holiday is um is very disrespectful to their lineage and their legacy but uh we do take advantage of the fact that everybody has that time off as far as getting together with our family same with you know a day like christmas kids are out of school the children are on holiday break and it's that time for families to get together but with covid and with this new variant that they're speaking of people are riddled with fear and the times that people are re are used to reconnecting with their families has been there's like a dark there's really a dark cloud that's been put over um families heads we have um the elderly community which you know needs a lot of times the most love and affection and attention but has been the the population that has been um you know it this COVID thing has taken the, the hardest toll on the elderly community um, because of the immune system, their, susceptib their, their susceptibility of uh, contracting um, COVID has, is in increases. So what does that mean? It's, does that mean that grandma and grandpa, yaya, nada, don't get to come to the festivities for the holidays? Does that mean that you know, Nana has been in the nursing home all year. Um, Baba has been in the nursing home all year, looking forward to that time to see the grandchildren, to connect with, you know, the great grands and to connect with the family. Does that mean that they don't get to be a part of the holiday season and, and connect with their loved ones? 
because of a fear of being exposed? I mean, are people making people get COVID tests before they can go to enjoy this time with their family? And if somebody tests positive for COVID, does that mean that they don't get to enjoy the holiday season? I just, I think it's, it's heartbreaking um, really what this pandemic has done to just the, the heart. And, um, you know, one thing that we all have in common is the heart. We all have a heart um, and the fragility of the heart. You know, uh, I, I posted earlier about, you know, the fact that a lot of people are take drugs, drink. It's a very heavy, heavy time that people are like drinking a lot during holiday season, drugging a lot during holiday season. It's to numb the heart, you know, the fragility of the heart. We're governed by, you know, our, our hearts, but sometimes the pain is too, um, it's too overwhelming that people don't want to tap into their heart space, their emotions, because they would find what comes up is too unbearable. So the drugs and the alcohol are escapism, and these are self-soothing and self-coping mechanisms to avoid feeling, right? The holidays are a time with people, these things come up during the holidays, big time. So on one end, right? Because I got different sides to me. I got the side that's more like the empath and the healer. And then I got a side that's a little bit uh, less kind, you know, that's more of, um, that, that is more uh, combative because I take all of that and I take the feelings of all of the collective humanity and the children and the grandparents and the communities that aren't gonna be with their families during this holiday season and I absorb that and rather than, you know, it, morphing into it's, it's empathy but it gets morphed into uh some degree of rage and i'm i don't i don't have a, a, a rage i don't ingest rage like i don't have fury um that resides inside of me because i uh i like being in a calm state but I'm able to process it up here and say, well, who's to blame? Who's to blame for that grandparent that has to spend the holiday in the nursing home? And that's when the other side comes out of me. When we, when we dig deeper as far as the government's contribution to people not being able to experience this holiday, to the rise of depression, to the rise of suicide, to the rise of drug addiction, to the rise of addictions. How did the government play a part in this? With the fear mongering and the media and all of these things. But that's somewhat of a conversation for another day. So this holiday season definitely to many people has a damper on it. And um, you know, when we talk about Christmas, the root word being Christ, we have to ask ourselves, are we being Christ-like? No, I'm not Christian, but I get tremendous overwhelming love from my Christian kin, from my family members who are Christian. Some of the best people that I know are devout Christians. Some of the people that I love the most and give me the most love and are the most compassionate are devout Christians. My grandma Annie, devout Christian. So I have no beef with the Christian community, especially devout Christians. I'm just not a Christian. Um, what does Christian mean? The root word being Christ, a follower of Christ, a follower of Jesus Christ. I say to my Christian brothers and sisters, you are my kin. You are, you are absolutely my kin because we share Christ consciousness we just don't have the same i we don't have the same um definition of who christ was but in my heart and soul i believe that christ did exist 
I don't necessarily believe that he was the God in flesh as many Christians believe, but I believe he was a very holy, holy, holy prophet, very holy man with special abilities. And why do we talk about Christmas and COVID and family gatherings? Well, Christmas, Christian, being like Christ, Christ consciousness, who was Christ? Christ was a healer. Christ wasn't worried about what the community was saying about him. Christ was doing the work that God gave him to do, period, point blank. Christ came here with a very specific assignment. Christ was very anointed. His background was very unique and distinct. And Christ had an overwhelming love an overwhelming love for the people that the Antichrist were so repelled by his love. Those that were fueled with hatred, because hatred and haters, this is nothing new. You go to the Bible. You go to these ancient texts, they talk about haters. Christ has some serious haters. They wanted to kill that man. They wanted to take that man out. Why? His overwhelming love was unbearable for the haters. He had love to say he had love and he had faith to such a high degree. That they they you know were they were ostracizing the lepers, the lepers people who were who were had leprosy. They had to be quarantined because they didn't want them mixed with the general public out of fear that the general public would get leprosy. Christ had no fear in his heart. Christ had no fear in his heart to the point where he went to be with the lepers because he knew he could heal the lepers. His faith in the creator was so profound that he wasn't fearful of potentially contracting leprosy he believed in his power to such a high extent and high degree that he said, not only will I be among the lepers, I have the power to heal the lepers. They say Jesus walked with the prostitutes. You got Christians right now who don't want to be associated with somebody with a certain reputation because of how it may look on them. That's not Christ-like. That's not Christ-like. Jesus was chilling with the prostitutes, not because he was trying to buy them and sleep with them. He didn't care about these worldly things like reputation and how things would appear to the common man. This is what being Christ-like is. This is Christ consciousness, people. So if you call yourself a Christian on this Christmas day, if you say you have Christ consciousness, then it's time to embody that. How are you treating your family members? How are you handling this whole COVID thing? Fear and faith don't exist, but I see Christians acting very, 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 very fearful. You don't look to that book, the book that governs you, the Bible that says God has a cure for all things. You put your faith in man over God. So shout out to my Christians, Christian brothers and sisters, the devout ones. Um, I was making a joke some time ago. I said, you know, my father was an imam. And I said, I think that part of the reason why I, you know, had, had a kind of went away from religion and went away from Islam for some time was I really did 
look up to my dad and really want to be like the leader of a mosque one day. I said, maybe I could do that, you know? I said, I really wanted to like teach people, like be like, but women weren't allowed to be imams. And then when you study the prophets, there's no women prophets. And I'm like, man, like, that's interesting because women were so powerful. We're so, 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 so powerful. We're so powerful. Um, our maternal ability is a power in itself, the ability to carry a child and the gestation process and how our body, it, 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 you know, caters to holding a child and being a conduit of life. We're so magical as women. And we are more, we are more intuitive, actually. Women have, have an internal intuition and so i believe that there were women with prophetic power i believe that there were women in time with prophetic power i believe that there's women that walk with us today in our turn our current uh time and space with absolute and utter prophetic power and we're talking about christ who in our faith is a prophet and so i want to shift the conversation to the female prophets the women prophets if there is such a thing I observed over the past couple decades that um, back in the day, we didn't, black women didn't wear as much makeup as we do collectively now. I don't, I don't have any face makeup on. I don't have any foundation. I don't own foundation. I don't have any concealer or anything like that, but I used to. Back in the day, I used to, all my makeup came from MAC. Back in high school, I used to have the MAC foundation, the MAC concealer, NW45, I think, NW50. I might still have one concealer in NW, um, but I don't wear a concealer. concealer. Um, MAC um, mascara, um, MAC blush, you know, I would, have, I would have a full face of makeup on every single day from the time I was like 15 past college, full face of makeup, weave, perm, straight, um, and full face of makeup, meaning foundation, concealer, blush, lipstick, eyeliner, mascara, sometimes eyeshadow, or do my eye, fill my eyebrows and all that stuff every single day. And there were people that knew me that had never seen me without any makeup on. And I remember Annie, my grandma Annie telling me one day, she said, you know, I never wore makeup. She said, because the minute that people see you without it, you're scary. <laughs> She's like, you know, that, that, that's a problem. And you have people right now that cannot allow people to see them without makeup. You have men right now who have never seen their women without makeup. I think it is so crazy. But they'll, they'll, they'll like get up out of bed before the man wakes up and like do their full face and like get back in bed, you know, like that's bizarre. Um, I was talking to a guy one, one time, he said he was dating this woman and um, she had a skin condition where, uh, I don't know if it's, you know, it's like where parts of the skin are a different color. You know what I'm talking about? It's like, they have like white patches, which I've seen albino, I've seen beautiful albinos um, I have scars, you know, and my skin is, I have stretch marks and my skin is not perfect by any means, but you know what I'm talking about with the condition, you know, and there was even a model in Victoria's Secret. She had that skin condition, beautiful woman. Um, but he never knew she had that skin condition because she would not allow him to see her without makeup on. And so makeup can be so transforming that it can actually cover up every single like blemish, every single, you see people, sometimes you get up close to them and it's like, like, like a whole, like thick, like a thick mask. But here's a, here's a part of it. What is the problem? The, pro the problem is, and it really is no problem because it, I, I'm very much about people's free will. How you choose to present yourself to the world is really how you choose to present yourself to the world. I'm not saying I'll never wear makeup again. I'm not saying I'll never wear fake hair again. You know, I, I currently have my natural hair, but to say that I'll never ever wear fake hair, I might. Special occasion or if I want to spruce it up or jazz it up or whatever. 
why not? You know, it's not that serious. Um, I feel like braids are very much a part of our African heritage, are very much a part of our African culture. But I do like liking myself and how I look without all the extra stuff. That I can look at myself in the mirror and like how I look without all the extra stuff. And how is this on a health and wellness level? How does this? Well, I think that it was deliberate. And I don't, you know, you can call me a conspiracy theorist all you want, but I believe that it was deliberate. When I look at pictures of my mother and I look at pictures of my grandmother, these women were so beautiful, so beautiful, just beautiful women, African women with just these gorgeous features and just this flawless chocolate skin and just beautiful women. My mom was kind of petite. My grandma was kind of petite. You know, nice bodies, no fake hair. My mom never used to wear fake hair. Both had natural hair. My mom used to have a low fro, which is gorgeous women. And um, I thought about them and how, like, back in the day, women in the 70s were just so bad. And bad meaning fly. Fly, fly meaning gorgeous. And um, I love men, you know what I mean? But I, as a woman, I've seen with my own eyes. I can see and observe a, a woman that has, has a lot of beauty. And women back then were naturally beautiful. And especially African women because of the fact that the days are longer in Africa. And they're in the sun. And the sun is like magic to our skin. And so their skin would just like radiate, just glow naturally. No face makeup, no foundation, none of that. Just gorgeous, gorgeous skin. And natural hair. This was really before the introduction of weaves on like a mass scale back in the 70s. Now here in America, from my, the way that I see it, when I see 70s movies and I see like even in Carrie, which is like one of my favorite movies. Carrie, I love Carrie. Such a classic, and I have coined the name that I'm the black, I'm the black Carrie. Um, but anyways, I was looking at Carrie, the the original '70s movie, and I'm just like, these women are beautiful. The white girls, like, beautiful. Carrie had freckles, and you know, like, they they looked different than they do now. And I said, well, why? You know, black, Latino women, black women, they all look very different um back in the 70s and i kept thinking like why 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 well makeup's always been a thing but i don't think women wore as much makeup as women do now and the fake hair the introduction of the weaves wasn't really introduced until the 80s and um i think that the the fast food thing like once the government ushered in this idea of this independent woman movement, which shifted the culture where women didn't feel like it was honorable to be a wife and a mother. They looked at their role as being a wife and a mother as trivial. And it was the indoctrination of this culture that made women feel like they weren't good enough or like being a wife and a mother was something that was like you were less than. And women bought into this idea that it was commendable to be like the guys who go out and work and be a breadwinner and be, they even introduced like the smoking of a cigarette to as like a uh, female empowerment like the guys can smoke a cigarette, you know, they wanted to make it look sexy and empowering and like, you know, like very like dom like I'm I'm dominant, like I can like smoke a cigarette and things. Um, so there was the ushering of that in for various reasons. Uh one reason was there was a necessity when men had to go to war. Um, they needed women to run the factories, but it's a, a plethora of reasons, but that's a conversation for another day. Why the government decided to usher in this indoctrination, usher in this culture. But with that, of course, if you're not home and 
now the stigma is, oh, you're a Susie homemaker, you're antiquated, you're archaic, you are not as, you know, chic as us working women who go out and earn Chic as us working women who go out and earn and have our own and all of these things. Once that brainwashing took place, women said, okay, fine, we can be like the men. We can go out where the breadwinners were all of these things, but I'll be damned if I'm coming home and, and cooking a meal. So then we saw the ushering in, in the, around the 1970s of TV dinners, this microwave culture where women were just picking up these dinners for the kids, already made, TV dinners throwing into the microwave. Um, in the 80s, there was this boom of fast food uh, places developing. So yes, there were McDonald's and all of those things back in the 60s and the 70s. But in the 80s, it was like, the, it like skyrocketed all of these, like just mass building of just like McDonald's and Burger King and like in the 80s, like all this stuff. Because the idea was, well, you know what? I'm a working woman and I'm not going to, I don't have time to really cook a home cooked meal. I need to hurry up, pick up the kids. We'll stop at Mickey D's. They'll eat in the car. It's just, you know, so with the ushering of a, in a fast food, I think that that's part of the reason why women look better in the seventies. I, I think I, I would, I have to do research, but I, I believe obesity was even uh, less. And a lot of these high cholesterol, high sodium, all of these things was, were, were not as much of a thing as it is now. And then the fibroids and the tumors and the cancer and all of these things that women are developing now. I believe that has a lot to do with the ushering in of fast food and how that became a culture. And the ushering in of women empowerment. Yes, we can go to the bar. We can order cocktails just like the guys. We can smoke cigarettes just like the guys, you know. Women, yeah, we could we could smoke a blunt. We could smoke a joint just like the guys. We earn just like the guys. And many of them say we're single moms. We're the mom and the fat father just like the guys. So I'll be damned if you take away the perks that the guys get to have. But what women didn't understand was that those perks also contributed to their health uh, disparities. And um, the declining of their, their beauty and their looks. Um, there is a certain level of preservation when you are in the home and you are cooking your own food and sometimes many women may have a garden, they're growing their own thing. There's a preservation in that. There's a preservation of your health and there's also a preservation of your looks. So why do I say this? What does this have to do with Jesus and being prophets and being prophetic and things like that? Well. This is not to put down any other women, you know. Um, I'm all about everybody feeling good about themselves. Why? Because the thing about it is, from the, for me analyzing the hate that I've received, I say, well, I wouldn't receive that hate if somebody felt good about themselves, right? If a woman saw the beauty that she had within, and if a woman was, like, very excited about her life, and a woman was, like, very much in love with her mate, her soulmate, and very much felt purposeful, she wouldn't really have the energy, the time, or the desire to be hating on another woman. So a lot of times the jealousy or all of these things come from deep-rooted inadequacy, which is why I don't pit women against one another. You're not going to hear me say black women are better than Latina women or white women are better than black women or whatever. I happen to be born in the skin that I'm in. So my self-knowledge and my self-discovery made me say, hmm, well, what's special? What's unique about this pigmentation, right? What What is unique about this? What what is different about me to know myself, right? And this is not me recognizing what this skin means and what this hair means and what me showing up in the avatar that I've been uh, selected by the most high to show up in should be no dig on you. You shouldn't feel inadequate or inferior by me recognizing who I am, right? And I have no issue, I take no problem with you recognizing what it means to show up in the avatar that you've shown up in. So this is no dig at other women, but based off of my research, based off of the things that I, I know about the melanin of our skin, and uh, this is how it relates to Christmas Day and Christ consciousness, is that we have 
a special ability. We have a, 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 our pineal gland is enlarged and we have more of a um, more intuitive ability. Melanin women are, are more intuitive. Um, our hair, the way that it stands up, right? Like, I can do that, right? I can, and my hair is not going to fall down. Why? When, when we think that this makes our hair look unkempt, right? Like, oh, wow, our hair is so unkempt. When you think of the mad scientists, when you always look at the mad scientists, they always have like this crazy hair, right? It's like all up in the air, like the mad scientists. Why? Because organically, our our hair is like little, um, it's like mm, receptors of universal messages. That's why our natural hair is like a superpower. It's magic. I believe personally that people who have designed a culture that wants you to put chemicals to straighten your magic, to straighten out your kinks and your magic, or to put fake hair, which has a different energy in it. A lot of times it's a ritual for mourning or grieving. I believe that it's designed that way to control you and to make sure that you, that you never rise up to being more powerful than other people. So if I can get you in between your ears and I, I can also make you ignorant to the superpower that is your hair, you will never rise up to your prophetic power as a prophetess, as a woman with the ability to like literally practice magic. Our skin. If our skin, if we just leave our skin alone, we will be just fine. I really believe that. I believe like if you just leave your skin alone, like don't put all that crap on it. Wash your face. A lot of the problems, eat clean. Because cause, um, it is told by Tehuti Maatara, he says that any skin disorder is a blood disorder. So when you have all of these things coming up on your skin, it's something going on with the blood. And so if you're taking good care of yourself, like people want to know, oh, your skin is good. What is your secret? It's really no secret. You don't eat crap. Your skin's going to be fine. You take good care of yourself. Your skin's going to be fine. Beauty, is, it comes from within. It come, healthy skin comes from drinking good water, drinking lots of water, eating right. It's no secret. But what I will say is that we live in a society that's naturally competitive. Naturally, you know? I mean, as far as the way that the competition has morphed itself into, I think that it's more demonic than it is angelic, than it is, you know, something that is Christ-like. Um, and that's a conversation for another day if, uh, if, competitive, if being competitive is actually natural, right? If survive, the idea of survival of the fittest is actually natural or um, if we do have enough abundance and, res and, and resources to actually share. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, but your skin, right? So those who f are fearful of you recognizing the fact that you are like magical. Your skin agrees with the sun. Your skin has vitamin D in it. Everybody, even white people have melanin. So when we say melanin, it's not just black people have melanin. White people have melanin too. Melanin is a superpower. It's a superpower. Latin people have melanin. Asian people have melanin. Everyone has melanin. But black people have more melanin. By far more melanin. So this melanin preserves our skin and it agrees with the sun. It has nutrients in it that preserve our skin, which is why a lot of times, you remember the Jet Black Beauty of the Week? You would see the Jet Black Beauty of the Week. She's 35. She looks like she's 21. You would see the Jet Black Beauty of the Week. They would do different age groups. She'd be 55. She looks like she's 30. She'd be 75. You're like, there's no way that this woman is 75. 
You're like, nah, man, they're lying. You're looking at the Jet Black Beauty of the Week. You're like, they're, they're literally lying. There's no way that this woman is 80 years old. There is no way. Some of the guys are like, yeah, I would actually holler at that 80-year-old. She's that bad. Fly. 80. Fly. <laughs> How? How is her skin so tight at 75 years old, 80 years old? Looking gorgeous. How? Not shriveled up, not pruned, like radiating. Beautiful. It's her melanin and the fact she took very good care of herself. So, and this is just a theory because I believe that every single woman has something very special about her, but they just have to, have to tap in. But I believe that there are women that are envious of that melanin. I believe that. And I believe that the culture of elevating women who lack melanin and putting down women who have more melanin is deliberate. It's an attempt to kind of um, create uh, in their mind some sort of restoration of the power because it's just so much power that melanin has. It's like, oh, like melanin has a lot of power. So how do you level the playing field and keep people who have naturally God given a lot of power by the level of melanin in their skin and their hair disadvantaged, in poverty, seen as undesirable, but elevating the ones with less melanin, that's the reason why. It's your power. You think that other groups of women, Asians actually, Asian women actually age generally very, 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 very well. That's one thing that Asian women and black women have in common. Asian women, you see Asian women aging very well. It's self-care. But when, it, when we talk about melanin, do um, you think that other groups of women don't observe and uh, d didn't get pissed as hell that your grandmother looks like, a, like she's your mother? You think that other women aren't like, these black bitches. You think that our culture that we've been handed isn't to sabotage us? You think they didn't brainwash you to make you feel like your melanin was ugly for a reason? Why? Why? Why do they put you down so much, queen? You're a prophet. Prophetess, that's why. Organically, you're magical. That's why they put you down so much. And they know what you don't know about yourself. They know the power in your hair. They know the power in your skin. You're a prophet. You have Christ-like abilities. You have Christ consciousness. You have prophetic blood. You have prophetic DNA. Your skin agrees with the sun. You're amazing. The makeup. If you read the ingredients in that makeup that you're wearing, a lot of those things can't be pronounced. I watched things like from the 70s. It wasn't around in the 70s, but from, from the past couple decades, I watched where... Black women who never used to wear, I mean, black women used to wear makeup, sure. But like, not the way black women wear makeup now. Like, we were okay back in the day with just like a fresh face and some lipstick. Even in the 90s, you know what I'm saying? Like, just some like red lipstick and a fresh face. We were cool with that. Now we gotta have the concealer and the da-da-da and then the blush and then the contouring, the contouring of our nose. They used to make fun of our noses. Why did they make fun of our noses? They said that we have big noses, monkey noses. Do you know that that's actually um, an asset to have a bigger nose? Because that means that you can breathe in more air. So everything that's up is down and everything that's down is up. They reverse everything, everything. Uh, they wanted to make you feel bad about the fact that you are naturally a prophet. Like you are naturally like magical. Back to the makeup ladies. So I noticed, I observed, and I noticed that white women started really toning down their makeup. I go out here in D.C. And it's not just, I mean, you go to L.A., it's different. You know what I mean? It, it, D.C. is a little bit more conservative. 
But I noticed, I'm like, a lot of these white women, they aren't wearing any makeup. I noticed that. I'm like, that's very interesting. Because back in the day, they used to wear more makeup. And I'm like, hmm. You might see them with just some a little bit of mascara on and some chapstick. I'm like, these white women don't wear makeup. That's very, I'm just observing. And then I see us with the full face. I mean, the full face and makeup. And I'm like, that's interesting how things got flipped. Just a couple decades ago, we weren't wearing makeup. They were wearing makeup. Now we wear makeup. They don't wear makeup. Why is this? And of course, I got to analyze. You know, I spend a lot of time in solitude, so I have times to kind of analyze things, think about stuff. I'm like, perhaps the people who designed the culture were envious of our skin. The chemicals in the makeup, not only are they detrimental to our skin, but they also age us. So perhaps it was rooted in jealousy that they wanted to be able to trick the fountain of youth that we naturally have by not wearing makeup because they know the crap that they put in that makeup and give us the makeup because they were envied, envying us because of our youth, our, our, our fountain of youth that we were naturally given. And you fell for it. You fell for it to the, to the extent that now you're bullying other women. She just needs to perm her hair. I just, you know, if she had a sew-in and if her hair was just straight, why, why doesn't she wear makeup? You fell for it so much that... So ladies, this is not to put any particular group down. Like I said, everybody has certain things that they can uh, recognize just by their, their search of self-knowledge that there are things that make them special. Okay, everybody but for the black women specifically just know that in, in your organic state you are very very powerful you are very much a prophetess and especially the deeply melanated ones you you're very magical you are very 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 magical you have christ-like ability don't let the culture take you out of the kingdom peace y'all